Hey, good morning, Athey Creek. Let's all stand together. I'm so glad you guys are joining us this morning. And we get another chance to worship the Lord and to get into the Word. Let's all sing out to Him. Angels, we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains.
fun time of year, Lord, where we get to sing these songs of Christmas, but really songs of praise. And what an amazing thing that God would visit humanity. Um, the psalmist declared, what is man that, um, that you visit him, uh, that you even think about us uh, is amazing, Lord. But we're thankful that not only did you come to visit us, but you came to save us from our sins. Dying on the cross, you sent your only begotten son, Lord. We're so thankful that we can worship today knowing that our sins are forgiven, that we have the hope of heaven and eternal life. Lord, we uh, do wanna be people of praise. Bless this service, Lord, and the people here this morning. We're thankful to be able to worship you and gather as you tell us in your word not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Lord, we're, we're just glad to be here on a Sunday morning. Please, Lord, I pray you'd find a congregation that is attentive to your word, that we'd give it due place in our heart in our minds and let it take effect in our lives. So bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's get right to it. Would you grab your Bible? We got work to do. We're going through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. Uh, I love going through the Bible and uh, we're gonna get a little bit work done today. Um, we're in Luke chapter 13, if you'd turn there. What do these dates have in common? October 7th, 2023, February 6th, 2023, March 11th, 2011, January 12th, 2010, December 26th, 2004, September 11th, 2001, and January 3rd, 1556. What do these dates have in common? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Terrorist attacks. Well, that's good. I mean, that's a good guess, but you're wrong. <laughs> it's not just that. Um, in fact, uh, you know, you notice maybe a couple dates there that maybe gave that away, September 11th and October 7th. Um, and I purposefully wove those in there to, uh, to deceive. Um, <laughs> But no, these dates all have something in common. And, and the actual answer to that is some of the most deadly single days in the world's history. Deadly days where a lot of people died in one day. And I'm not saying it's an exhaustive list and it's not the biggest. I think the October 7th one is the closest one to us just, uh, just weeks ago, uh, this horrific terrorist attack uh, in Southern Israel there, uh, horrible, horrible uh, terrorist attack. Um, but what were these other dates? So of course, October 7th was a Hamas attack on Israel. Um, 1,300 people were murdered that day, horrifically. 5,000 people injured, um, and many are still held hostage. Uh, that was on October 7th. Just, just a few months earlier in 2003, maybe this one snuck by you. Did you know that in Turkey, there was a earthquake? Um, uh, the, they call it the Turkey-Syria earthquake magnitude 7.8 on the Richter scale, 50,000 people died in one day. 50,000, that happened just this year and a lot of people didn't even know it happened in the world. It's, it's amazing that 50,000 people in the world can die in one day and people are like, what happened? That actually happened this year? Um, but that was a bad one. Um, maybe you guys remember March 11th, 2011, that was uh, the great East Japan earthquake and tsunami, killed uh, one, uh, over 18,000 people in one day. Um, uh, this is a shocker. In Haiti, 2010, uh, January 12th, um, a, a 7.0 magnitude earthquake, and it killed 200,000, approximately 200,000 deaths in Haiti. Uh, December 26th, 2004. Does anyone remember what that one was? Yeah, you might. You might remember this. Some of our Athey Creekers were over there when this happened. Uh, it was the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami. Uh, around Christmas time, remember that? Um, magnitude 9.1 to 9.3 on the Richter scale, depending on who you talk to. 230,000 people dead in one day. Uh, of course, September 11th, you guys know that one, 9-11 attack, uh, 2,977 people died that day, um, but many people have died since then, so the number is still rising on the death toll on that uh, because of the, uh, all the uh, peripheral damages that have been long lasting, but 6,000 people injured. The reason I went with the January 3rd, 1556, uh, that's quite a long time ago, um, but uh, historians believe this was the single most deadly day in history, uh, in all of history, at least recorded history. 
Um, we know uh, as Bible people, there's actually a deadlier day, um, the great flood of Noah where people died, but that wasn't a single day. That was over um, a year, you know, a, a year's period was the flood uh, that Noah, so we don't know how many days that was, but that was the most catastrophic event probably in the history of the world. But this one is in recorded history uh, outside of the Bible, 1556. Um, this is called the, the, the Shanxi, China earthquake. Um, they believe uh, 830,000 people died in one day. 800, that's close to a million people. That's, that's an amazing thing, just one earthquake. Um, now you say, Brett, uh, why are you talking about all this death and destruction? Well, these are the type of events and days that spark people's questions. And they start to question, you know, if God is love, then why do bad things happen on the earth? Why is there death and suffering and disease? Why do bad things happen to good people? Um, and um, if God is loving, why doesn't he stop all this stuff? Well, Jesus here in Luke chapter 13 is gonna face uh, similar questions and um, you know, um, calamity, both from natural disasters and human-induced evil, sinister mankind's behavior that also, uh, like, like violence and terrorism, that's why I included both of those in my list because both of those things are, are what Jesus is gonna address here in Luke chapter 13 in verses one through five. In fact, he's gonna even go on and talk about a, a parable that's gonna relate. We'll see that on Wednesday night. But I wanted you to, to, to see this because, um, you know, they're basically coming up saying, hey, Jesus, did you hear about what happened over here? And, you know, some people died. And, and Jesus is gonna respond. Um, how do you think Jesus would respond to that question? Well, why do those people have to die? And what's going on there? Um, I think Jesus, his response, his answer might, might surprise you. It might surprise you what Jesus said. Because, you know, Jesus, people marveled at his gracious words. And he was always speaking so um, uh, heartfelt compassion toward people that were, uh, you know, in trouble or even their sinners. You know, the woman caught in adultery. He was so compassionate and kind. But what is his answer to this? We're, well, we're going to see that right here. Let's begin. It's Luke 13, verse 1. It says, there were present at that season some that told him, Jesus, of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. <clears throat> now, uh, you say, what in the world does it mean that Pilate <clears throat> mingled these Galileans' blood with sacrifices? Well, therein lies a bit of a story. Um, and it's kind of important to know what they're bringing to Jesus and, and what, what do we know about this? And even your newer translations, that doesn't really help that much. It's like, what does it mean to mingle the blood with the sacrifices? I don't get that. Um, well, it, it starts with um, the fact that this is the way news traveled. They didn't have news or television. They had teleperson, you know, go and say, hey, did you hear about what happened over in Jerusalem? And, and it was just kind of oral passing on of news. That's the way this happened. So the news reaches Jesus but they're obviously seeking an answer from him when they're saying, hey, did you hear about what happened to these Galileans? Their blood mingled with sacrifice. And they're looking for a response from Jesus about what happened. Um, kind of like, you know, when, when you maybe first heard about um, October 7th and people say, what do you think about that? Or maybe you're, you're old enough to remember September 11th, you know, and, and what you were talking with people about. That's kind of what's going on here. There's, a, there's an event that took place and now they're kind of saying, hey, what do you think about this? So, so what's this thing, Pilate mingling Galileans blood with the sacrifice? Well, it starts with Pontius Pilate, who they, you know, the, the, the pipe puffing cardigan sweater wearing professors were always saying that he didn't even exist. The Bible invented Pontius Pilate, it's not a real guy. Until the late 1960s, they found an archeological stone in um, Caesarea Maritima there on the Mediterranean coast of Israel. Uh, when they were digging up Caesarea archeologically, they found this, this stone that had the inscription of Pontius Pilate, his date, his office, all that stuff. Uh, it's kind of cool. So, he, you know, he, the, the stones uh, shut the mouths of these critics of the Bible. Um, but it wasn't just the Bible that talked about, you know, Pontius Pilate. Uh, Josephus also talked about Pontius Pilate. Um, in fact, Josephus uh, is that first century historian. He lived in the first, you know, uh, 100 years, AD 37 to 100. And he wrote a huge volume of history from the first century, about the first century, all the way back through ancient times. He wrote history. He was a historian. Um, the reason that this guy is so important is because there weren't a lot of guys back in the first century writing about what was happening in that day. But this guy wrote volumes. It's called The Works of Josephus, several volumes. Um, 
But one of the fun things about Josephus is he tells us stuff about Pontius Pilate, which only confirms what the Bible actually says, which I always like how the Bible is always confirmed. Uh, it's a bet, good bet to believe the Bible. But here's what we know about Pontius Pilate from, from Josephus. This is stuff that's outside of the Bible. But it's, it, I believe it's somewhat uh, credible that this guy would write about it. Um, they believe, jo Josephus writes that Pontius Pilate got stationed as a Roman leader in Judea, probably because he was in trouble. Um, you know, in the movies when like um, one of the military guys uh, makes a mistake and they say, oh, you're gonna be stationed in Siberia. Like, like, you know, it's like a penalty. You get stationed somewhere horrible. Well, that's probably what happened to Pontius Pilate. He, he did probably something bad, stupid in Rome and said, okay, you're gonna go to Judea and you're gonna have to deal with those pesky Jews down there in Jerusalem. Good luck with that. Um, that's probably what happened. So he's already got kind of problems. He, he, he gets sent to, to, um, to Israel. Now, some of this is in the Bible, some of this is Josephus, but when you put the story together, he, he comes to Jerusalem thinking, man, I better do this right. I better make sure and control these pesky Jews in Judea. So he, he says, I'm gonna start with a show of force. And he rides with his horses and his huge army and they march right into Jerusalem. Dun, dun, dun. Like in the movies, you know, the Rome music in the background. Dun, 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 you know, as they're marching in and they've got their golden standards, the golden eagles and the golden lions and all this stuff and they're bringing it up. And he marches right onto the Temple Mount to kind of say, any questions who's in charge here? Here's the problem. Do you think the Jews liked having graven images of eagles and stuff like that on their holy temple mount? Um, well, this, this is how that went. Um, the Jews were there, Pontius Pilate comes to show a show of force marching up onto the temple mount. And, um, and the Jews come up and start screaming at him saying, get out of here. And, 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 he, and he says, if you guys don't get out of my way, I'm gonna kill you. And all the Jews, the old men on the temple mount, they, they ran up to Pontius Pilate and laid their necks on the ground and said, chop our heads off, kill us. Like they, they said, we wanna die if you're gonna defile our temple mount. And see now Pontius Pilate's got a problem. He's supposed to come and control, not kill all the Jews. He's supposed to come. And I wonder if the Jews knew this, uh, that he was sort of in a political pickle, but they, they called his bluff and said, kill us, chop our heads off. And they laid their necks on the ground to have their swords so the soldiers come and chop them off, but they, they wouldn't do that. So Pontius Pilate, turned around and said, sorry. And he went into the palace and kind of hid for a few months. Um, and that's the way he entered Jerusalem, strike one. Then another issue happened. He was trying to woo, that was, so, so goof number one. Goof number two is he said, I'm gonna try to appease the Jews and make them happy and beef up their infrastructure. So Pontius Pilate, like a lot of the Romans, uh, he decided to build them uh, some more aqueducts that would feed water, fresh water to some of the cities of Judea and that region. Um, the, the, the aqueducts in Israel are kind of fun. You can go visit them today. Some of them, they look as good as new. Some of these Roman aqueducts that they built 2000 years ago, they're, they're amazing engineering feats for you engineering types. You'd be shocked what these Romans were capable of. Um, one of the stretches of the uh, Roman um, aqueduct along the Mediterranean goes like for uh, 10 miles and the drop from mile one to mile 10, uh, you know, you have to have a downhill slope for an aqueduct to work. The drop in that aqueduct for 10 miles is a half an inch in a 10 mile run. Um, I don't even know if we could pull that off today with all of our uh, you know, electronic uh, wizardry uh, with lasers and levelers and all that stuff. But the, these Romans did that. Uh, it's, it's really cool. But um, so Pontius says, hey, we'll get these cities with some fresh water. The Jews will love me for it. That's what he said. The problem is, how did he fund the aqueduct? Anybody know that answer to that? Not taxes. Good, good guess though. They did tax the Jews a lot but he decided to take money from the temple treasury. He, he, he went to the temple. Uh, I don't think he understood how important the temple was to the Jews, but he went into the temple and took the temple money out of the treasury and said, I'm gonna build them aqueducts. Instead of all this wasting money on religion, we'll show them how Rome does things and they'll love it. Well, they freaked out. Now, here's what happened. Now, this is not in the Bible, this is Josephus. Um, a bunch of men from Galilee were so angry, they said, we're gonna go down and cause trouble because they stole from the temple of Jerusalem from the Jews. So the Galilean men got on their little donkeys and walked. Um, if you were to do that, by the way, from Galilee to Jerusalem, it'd be like if you were living in Wilsonville and you got your donkey and you, and you went all the way to Eugene, that's where these Galilean men went. That's how far it was, exact distance. 
from Galilee to Eugene, or from Wilsonville to Eugene, that's Galilee to Jerusalem. So these guys get there and they, they also get up on the Temple Mount and they start protesting. Well, Pontius Pilate, according to Josephus, puts a bunch of his Roman soldiers undercover. Um, their swords are hidden. And they, they, he says, go in there and try to make these guys go away, try to you know, de-escalate the situation. I can't afford another problem. But what happened was the, the, um, the guys went out there to try to calm them down, these undercover Romans, um, but the Galilean men sniffed it out and they got even more furious. And it turned out to be a thing where the Romans, by the way, um, they, uh, the soldiers began to feel threatened for their very lives. And so they drew their swords and it became a bloody massacre. And the Galilean men were slaughtered there by the Roman soldiers. Um, strike two, goof number two, uh, Pontius Pilate. He's not doing a good job keeping the peace down there. Now you say, Brett, what does that have to do with anything? Well, most scholars believe what Josephus wrote about there is exactly what they're telling Jesus about in Luke chapter 13, verse one, same event. Um, so what happened? When, when the language is that Pontius Pilate mingled the blood of Galileans with the sacrifice, the word sacrifice is really them saying at the Temple Mount where the blood sacrifice of the lamb is supposed to be, the, the Galileans' blood was mixed with the blood sacrifice there on the temple. It was kind of a figure of speech that only the Jews would fully appreciate. So most people believe that's, that's what happened. By the way, um, um, that was strike two. What was strike three with uh, Pontius Pilate? Um, it probably was none other than the events that took place in the Bible with Jesus of Nazareth. Um, uh, have, you, you know, have you ever thought, why, do, why does Pontius Pilate in the story of Jesus in the Bible seem like such a pushover, such a, a wimpy leader when it comes to the trials of Jesus? Um, I think the answer, you know, you know how like he's saying, I, don't, I see no fault in this man. Why do you guys want to crucify him? And he even <clears throat> makes this public display where he washes his hands in front of everybody. He says, I'm washing my hands. If you want to kill him, I guess you can do that. But, but, but I'm washing my hands. I don't want to take any blame for this. He, why is he such a weak, weird leader? I think he's just hanging by a thread right now, trying to, trying to keep peace of somehow so he doesn't, you know, get in trouble. Well, as it turns out, did the whole Jesus of Nazareth crucifixion work out really well for the Romans? What's interesting, by the way, if you kind of know your history, that would be the downfall of the Roman Empire. Like the, when Jesus died on the cross, that kind of is the beginning of the end for the Romans, which uh, it took a long time after that to make that happen. But uh, that, that's an interesting story in and of itself. But, but his handling of Jesus was goof number three. So you say, okay, Brett, well then what happened to old Pontius Pilate? This is where it gets interesting. If you ask the historians that are in the know, there's two stories that are very different and we don't know which one's true. Um, the oldest story is that Pontius Pilate, um, uh, after the, the Jews uh, were freaking out after the crucifixion of Jesus and there were troubles shortly thereafter, um, the one story uh, is that uh, they took Pontius Pilate and pretty much fired him and made him go into exile where a few months later he killed himself. Uh, that's the first story, he committed suicide. The second story popped out later in history where they were doing some archeological digs in Israel and they found a first century church, a Christian church, which is pretty rare. Um, I love these first century churches that are Christian where they have mosaics of the cross and stuff because there's a lot of times where people are like, the church was just an invention of the third century, 300 years later. None of that really happened. A lot of your so-called scholars say that. So every time they find a first century church in Israel and dig it up, it's kind of like, uh, you guys are wrong again. But, um, but they found a first century church that had in, in, uh, in mosaics and also uh, stone writing, they found the story of Pontius Pilate and his wife. And the story goes that Pontius Pilate's wife became a Christian after Jesus died on the cross. And then a few months later, Pontius Pilate himself became a Christian, a believer. Um, and that's the second story. Um, uh, which one's true? I don't know, but I hope the second one's true. Wouldn't it be something if we get to heaven and we see old Pontius Pilate? We're like, who's that guy? He's like, oh, that's Pontius Pilate. It's the one who sent Jesus to the cross. Yep, he made it to heaven. That just would show how gracious God is. Hey, listen, if Pontius Pilate can make it, maybe you can make it too. <laughs> um, it's amazing, the grace of God. So I believe that's possible, but we don't know. I almost wonder if history has two stories because you know everybody's gotta make the Pontius Pilate decision. Um, are you gonna accept Christ or are you gonna reject him? One leads to death, one leads to life. And, uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So, 
So here in verse one, some told Jesus that of, the, of the situation that happened there to the Galileans uh, that were slain on the Temple Mount. Um, uh, we don't know why they're bringing this up to Jesus until we hear Jesus's answer. And then we start to think, okay, Jesus knows what their intentions are in bringing up this, this question about, hey, what happened to those Galileans? What do you think about that? And there, there, you might sense there's some intentions. We'll see. Let's keep reading. Verse two, it says there, and Jesus answering said unto them, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. But that, that, that answer that Jesus gives, what's he saying? It's kind of like, what do you think about those guys that died, uh, the Galileans? And just, yep, they died and you're gonna die too. Oh, and, and Jesus even takes, remember those guys who were crushed by the tower by the pool of Siloam? Um, 18 men, they died. Do you think they died because they were worse than everybody else? No, they just died. And guess what? You're gonna die. You know how I love to quote that uh, 10 out of every 10 people die? The shocking statistic. It's almost like that's what Jesus is saying here. Uh, 10 out of every 10 people die. So why are you asking me about death? Um, uh, it might seem a little cold, uh, uh, sort of an answer in a time of tragedy and calamity to Jesus. But, but the first thing we see here is that Jesus seems to be dealing with a problem of they all were ascribing, you know, the guilt of sin that, oh, they must've died because they did something wrong. That was a very uh, first century Jew thing. Uh, we still do that today, but there was a real problem. They, they, they thought back in those days, man, if you died by the edge of the sword, you must've done something really bad to deserve it. Those pesky Galileans must have been sinful. That's why Pontius Pilate killed them because you know it's like uh, karma or fate or whatever. That's the way they sort of looked at it. But Jesus is basically saying, nope, those guys died because guess what? You're all gonna die. Everybody dies. Um, uh, but he doesn't just leave it there. You might, if he just left it there, that'd be like, well, thanks for the nice word of encouragement. But he does say, except you repent you will die in the same way. Wait a minute, so is there hope of not dying? Well, the answer is yes, but this is where you and I have to kind of put on our thinking caps because the Bible and, and people, Satan, everybody gets confused by this. There's actually a couple different kinds of death we can talk about in the Bible. The two big ones, we can talk about death when your heart stops and you cease, your body dies. Um, that's one version of death. Um, but the Bible almost handles that, especially if you're a Christian, like that's no big deal, whatever. Small event in your life. Um, we think of it as the biggest event. When, when you die, oh, that's such a big, but the Bible treats that one as like, eh, it's not that big a deal. Why? Because there's something about what happens after that. That's what becomes the big deal. And it's also life and death, um, eternal death or eternal life. And see, this is where I think Jesus is talking about, unless you repent, you're gonna die just like they all died, unless you repent. So what does repentance have to do with whether, you're not, whether or not you're gonna die? It has to do with eternal life and death. This is the trick Satan played on Adam and Eve when they, they're in the Garden of Eden. He said, did God really say in the day you eat of this fruit, you'll, you'll die? You will not die, but your eyes will be opened and you'll um, you know, become wise. You know, like th this is what, the way Satan lured them. And so Eve bit the fruit, Gave it to her husband, he bit the fruit. Did they kick over dead that very moment? No, was Satan correct? He was, you know, it's funny how Satan loves to twist a little bit of truth and that's what he did. They really didn't die, their bodies that is, but that's where eternal death um, became the deal. Not just for Adam and Eve, but for all of humanity and not only uh, humanity, but all of creation was in a fallen state of death. Um, that's the problem. That's what sin did. God was right. Only God was talking about the bigger version, eternal death and eternal life, the question there. And that's what Jesus, I believe, he's talking about the same. I'll show you what I mean here in a, in a bit. But um, Jesus refers to this Tower of Siloam collapse where 18 people were killed. We don't know anything about that other than what Jesus just told us. So it was probably another event 
uh, around there. I think it's interesting. The first calamity was uh, terrorism, human-induced slaughter. Um, the second event was a falling of a tower that killed a bunch of people, more of a you know a natural disaster of some kind. Maybe an earthquake knocked it over and killed those people. We don't know. Two events, man-induced natural calamity, um, and that's kind of what Jesus is dealing with today. That's, that's what we're talking about. You're like, thanks a lot, Brett. Last, last Sunday, last Sunday you gave us the six woes of Christmas. And now you're saying death to the world. The, you know, it's like, a, it's like, this is a great Christmas series. You're, no, I don't do series like that. I, we just go in verse by verse through the Bible. But th this is a pretty grave, gloomy sort of topic on a dark and rainy morning. But there's a beautiful, bright, wonderful truth uh, embedded in this dark, gloomy topic that I want to um, give to you. And that is, um, let's just do some consideration of this, what Jesus is talking about. Consideration number one, something for you to think with me on. It, um, it's not as much the question, why is there so much tragedy? But the better question is, why is there so much mercy? Um, people say, if God is love, why is there tragedy on the earth? Well, um, if God is love, why doesn't he just kill us all? See, we, 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 we've been taught by our you know, parents and school teachers, you, know, you won the blue ribbon and they got the trophy and you're a good person and people like you and people are basically good, humanity is good and, you know, and all this stuff. But the Bible teaches the opposite of that. There's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one that actually seeks God. There's no one that doeth good. The Bible tells us that over and over and over again. So um, basically you gotta remember when people say, why do bad things happen to good people? The, the real answer, and a lot of people don't like this, but according to the Bible, there are no good people. That's just the truth. We're all sinners. I'm good. You're, you're really not. And that's part of my job as a pastor is to con convince you. In fact, that's your job. If you're gonna be a preacher of the gospel, one of the things we have to help humanity understand is, man, what Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Um, this is our number one challenge for non-believers to convince them of their need for salvation. Um, you know, the world in contrast says you're a good person, humanity is good, I'm good enough, people like me. The truth is you're a sinner. And the price of sin, according to the Bible, and this is what Jesus is saying, you're all gonna die because the wages of sin is death. So if all are sinners, then all are under sin and death. And man, what a horrible thing it is uh, if we're talking about eternal death. And you know, if you're still one that kind of thinks you're good enough, just try to think, you gotta understand, sin in the Bible is not just murder and adultery. It is those things too. But it's even the little stuff that we don't count as sin if you're off the target just even a little bit. You know, if you have a bad attitude, that's called sin. And if you've never murdered anybody or committed adultery and you've had a bad attitude or anger, or you, you know, um, just didn't quite do something with the right heart or motivation, that's all called sin. I think, I think we're gonna be shocked when we get to heaven and see what really counted as sin. And that'll make us all the more happy that God forgave us for all those sins. If you're a Christian, um, you know, um, the Lord sees everything you've ever done. So you might be able to convince us you're basically a good person. When we look at you, we might say, maybe, maybe not. But God knows the secret things that you've done. Hebrews 4.13, but all things are naked and open before him with whom we have to do, the Bible says. Can you imagine if you had like a little gauge uh, over your head when you were lying or if, you're, if your motivation is off and we can just look at your gauge. Oh, are you being honest here right now? It's a good. Um, I actually, let's, let's say I have that technology. This, this mo motive, <coughs> motive meter, um, you know, you, I come and talk to you and you stand on the stage here and I say, hey, um, why are you here at church? And you're like, I'm here because I just love the Lord with all my heart. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, and you're like, hey, wait a minute, why is that bad? Uh, well, uh, okay, somebody dragged, my, my, my wife made me come to church. Oh, oh that's why you're here, okay. Um, got it. Uh, okay, I, I know I know I'm a sinner. That's why I'm supposed to be here at church. I'm a sinner. That's correct, Pastor. Oh, oh, wait, wait, um, wait. Uh, maybe you're here because because you want to network and have some good business contacts at Athey Creek. Uh, that's that last one there. Um, uh, that's a bad motivation of why you're at church. Wouldn't it be something if we had a meter to see everything that came out of your mouth and what your motivations were? Guess what? God sees all that and he knows all that. He's got that little meter just tell, oh yeah, you're, you're convincing all those Athey Creekers you're here because of this. Um, but we really, God really knows why you're here or, or why you did what you did or why you gave of the tither offering or why you didn't. Um, all that, the Lord sees it all. 
and he, you know, he's, he, he knows all this. So before you start thinking, I'm not that bad of a person, just remember God sees it all. That's so important. Um, you know, um, we're all equally guilty. We're all deserving of eternal death. But Jesus says something that really should catch our attention in this story, unless or except you repent. What does repentance have to do with death? Um, the answer is everything. Jeremiah spoke on this in Lamentations 3.22. Um, this, is the, this is the mindset you and I really should have. See, when people say, if God is love, why do bad things happen to good people? That's the wrong the wrong question. This is the right one. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. See, that's the wonder. It's not why do bad things happen to me? The wonder is why do I, why am I still kicking and breathing and not burning in hell? That's the right question. Um, any good day you have, you just think, wow, why am I having a good day? See, we get, why am I having such a bad day? That should be considered normal and what you deserve. Um, that's the right mindset, according to the Bible. But when we have a good day, we can say, oh, Lord, you're so gracious and your compassions fail not and your mercies are new every morning. Um, and this is what Jer Jeremiah talks about there in Lamentations. What we deserve is to be vaporized. What we get is mercy. The question is not why is there tragedy? The, the question really is, why are we still alive and kicking? And it's because of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. And it's because his compassion fails not. So number one, it's not why is there so much tragedy in the earth? We need to realize it's rather, why is there so much mercy? Why is the Lord allowing us to not only live on, but live most of us happily, comfortably, uh, even with a few bad days here, it's, there is no big deal compared to what we deserve. The second consideration I'd like to think about is calamity is not God's way necessarily of communication but rather the result of man's rebellion. You know, when Hurricane Katrina happened, I remember a uh, pastor, national pastor, gone, this is God's judgment upon the United States. And I remember hearing that thing, ah, I'm not sure that's exactly what's going on. Could be uh, God, you know, um, trying to correct us. The Bible teaches us, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Uh, we're not to despise the chastening of the Lord. So the Lord does correct us. And he'll, I think he'll use cataclysmic things in our lives and in our nation to get us back on course. But, you know, uh, we have to remember he's not punitively punishing the United States for their sins. If the Lord punitively punished the United States for sins, what would that mean? Anybody? Death to all. Annihilation. That's what the Bible says. If the Lord's punishing us for our sins. Now, here's the sad part of this story. Did you know that actually is gonna happen? Um, the Lord is faithful to, to keep his promise. And there is a time where God's gonna say, time's up. He did that in the Old Testament, by the way, with the Malachites and some of the Canaanites, when the Lord said, I want you to utterly destroy these people. And, and people get all up in a tizzy about that, but they don't realize that people group, they were doing horrific, evil things. Would it be loving for God See, people say, if God is love, why would he wipe out a whole, you know, and people accuse God of ethnic cleansing, which is a false accusation, by the way. Um, what God was doing was protecting a people group from a very dangerous, ugly thing that was already, it was like a rabid dog. Why do you shout the, did any, did anybody see Old Yeller when you were a kid? Uh, they had to shoot Old Yeller because he was rabid. Um, in a way, if you don't wipe out Old Yeller, then uh, the kids and the other animals are gonna all die because of that one dog. So that was the lesson I learned. I'm still in, uh, you know, somewhat going through counseling because of that show uh, when I was a kid. Um, but the Amalekites were literally taking babies and putting them on the red hot sizzling arms of Moloch, their God. And like they'd give their babies to and sizzle their babies on these hot gods. And the, the mothers would shriek and the babies would scream and they'd pound these drums. It was this satanic, demonic, evil practice that some of these Canaanite people groups were doing. And the Lord says, it's not, it's not loving to let these people keep doing this. They were so corrupt as a people group and it was starting to bleed over into the Jews. The Jews were starting to take on some of these characteristics from these Canaanite people. And the Lord says, I want you to utterly destroy these people because they're, the, if you would, they're the rabid dog. That's, that's what happened in the Old Testament. So people shake their puny little fists. If God is love, then why would he wipe out the Amalekites in the Bible? And people use that one all the time. And the answer is because he is love, because he is love. Um, that's what love does, protects the people that he loves. 
So um, some people try to say calamity upon a nation or something is God's communication. And, but one of the answers you and I need to reveal to people is, man, the cataclysmic, catastrophic, horrible things that happen in the world, um, it's not as much God communicating, he can and does, but it's more the result of man's rebellion. It's because sin is brought in the world. And because of sinful man, um, the world is in a fallen state. Even the so-called natural disasters, there were no hurricanes and earthquakes and volcanoes and stuff like that during the Garden of Eden era. The world was not in a fallen state. But after Adam and Eve sinned, the world was in a fallen state. By the way, one of the things that's gonna happen in the millennial kingdom, I believe, is um, the, the, the world is gonna improve and get back into a state of, um, of not fallen state that we're in right now. I always laugh when I see, you know, remember back in the, you know, uh, 80s and 90s, the tree huggers and the, you know, the tree people organ, you know, and all this stuff and people chaining themselves and hugging trees and stuff. And I, I just remember the Bible. Uh, the Bible says that the world's in a fallen state right now, but it says during the millennial kingdom, all the trees in the fields will clap their hands when the Lord comes and rules and reigns. If you want to, if you care about trees, pray for the return of Jesus. Because uh, the trees are going to clap their hands, whatever that looks like. I don't know. I wouldn't mind seeing a giant redwood going. They're going to be on. Finally, the fallen state of the world is over. Um, so, if you care about the earth and all that, uh, you should actually pray for the second coming of Christ. But, um, but God's, you know, um, you know, God's not punishing punitively, but correctively. But more importantly, the, the bad things that happen in this world, instead of blaming God, insurance, your insurance policy, if you're, a tree falls on your car, they say, well, that was an act of God. Um, well, you have to understand it was actually an act of man and Satan. The world is in a fallen condition. That's why things die. That's why trees fall. That's why everything bad that's happened. So um, uh, keep in mind, it's not the Lord punishing us for our sins too, because we know what the punishment of sin is. It's, e it's eternal death in hell. That's what the Bible says. So what about the Old Testament when God would send calamity and stuff like that? Um, by the way, did you know Amos the prophet, he kind of spoke it like it was. The Lord tried to warn people over and over saying, repent of your sins, but when they wouldn't, it's like their own sins would bring calamity upon themselves. Um, Amos chapter three, verse seven, um, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealed his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The prophets came and said, repent from your sins, but they just kept sinning and sinning. And then eventually the Lord said, okay. And it's not like the Lord crushed them, but the Lord did say, okay, I'm lifting my hand of protection from you. And now whatever's gonna happen to you is gonna happen because of your rebellion. Um, are you a person that when bad things happen to you, you get mad at God and say, well, God's allowing this in my life. Um, again, we have to change our perspective. If you're not burning in hell for all eternity, you should be thankful you're still alive and kicking. We should be grateful for that because that's his mercy. It says the Lord's mercies that were not consumed. But for not only that, for us to shake our puny little fists at God, I heard a sermon from a local church here in Portland uh, somebody you know, said, Brett, you gotta listen to this. And I was shocked when this pastor said, we need to forgive Jesus. We need to forgive him. I'm like, uh, well, well, first of all, Jesus never sinned. What do we need to forgive him for? And he went on and said, I know it sounds like heresy, but, and I'm like, yeah, sounds heresy. Uh, got that right. Um, and then he says, we need to forgive Jesus when things don't go our way, the way we want them to go. We need to learn to forgive Jesus for that. Um, hold on a second. So you're telling me we need to forgive Jesus because I didn't get my little thing. When Jesus is the one who died on the cross, bled for my sins so that I wouldn't burn in hell for eternity. And you're saying we need to forgive Jesus for something? That is heresy. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Um, that's an abomination. Uh, that pastor should not say such things. Uh, that's horrible, horrible. Um, but there's, that's, that's human nature. We like to blame people. And as it turns out, people are getting more bold to say, well, God is allowing all these horrible things to happen in the world. No, that's the result of fallen man, sinful man. Um, and that's just where we are. And, and, and all the repercussions are just because of our sin. Disease, death, all that's because of sinful humanity. Um, if you want to look at that up close on a subject, let me just give you one example out of hundreds I could actually give. But, um, you know, one example of that is this idea of, uh, uh, you know, what sexuality should look like. Um, we have, as a people in the world, said God doesn't know anything about human sexuality. We alone know how sex works. And, and so where are we at now? 
well, now we're saying that men can have babies and men can menstruate. And uh, what is a woman? And, um, and we've gotten so wacky. Like it, it goes way past just uh, having sex outside of marriage and all that. We have just con con you know, totally um, contorted the whole sexual thing. Um, and, and my question is, how's that been working out for us? Um, and all the problems we have, people, well, if God is love, why is there a disease? Well, let's talk about disease. For example, sexually transmitted disease. Um, did you see this? Uh, welcome to Oregon. Statesman Journal, just a, uh, about a week ago, or a couple weeks ago, sexually transmitted infections, including syphilis and gonorrhea, on the rise in Oregon. Um, yeah, how bad on the rise? Um, this, this is where this article is, uh, uh, the, the writer of this article tries to identify the factors that have caused this. Do you think they're gonna get it right? Here's the factors. Factors such as discrimination, and poverty, drug use, inadequate access to healthcare, lack of health insurance, housing, and education inequality increases the risk for contracting an STI. No, having sex with someone increases the risk. Unless, as it turns out, there, there is safe sex, and it's not what your high school health class told you. Safe sex is not wearing a condom. If you believe that, uh, I got a bridge I can sell you from uh, New York, Brooklyn. Um, but the idea of safe sex is ridiculous. Ask your doctor, and if you have an honest doctor, say, is there such thing as safe sex even with a condom? And the answer is no, because there's a lot of these STIs, if you, if you study them and are even halfway interested, it's shocking. Um, skin to skin contact will give uh, some really brutal and even deadly diseases. And, and it's on the rise in Oregon exponentially right now. And nobody wants to get to the real root of the problem. We're saying it's because of um, education inequality and discrimination, all this stuff, that's what's happening. But um, what about, they forgot to mention rebellion against God. That's what's caused this. If we would do sexuality in the way God's word tells us, I know people think, Brett, you're a religious prude. Yeah, but, but this is what the Bible says, one man, one woman, monogamous relationship for their whole life. If you do that, guess what? You'll never have an STI, ever. Just, you'll, you'll, you'll have, in fact, the Bible even says the marriage bed is undefiled. Sexuality within marriage is beautiful and perfect. This is what God's word said. And if we would just believe that, we would eradicate sexually transmitted infections forever. That's the way it would happen. But humanity says, no, God, we want to do it our way. And we are free. We're free to have sex. And the Lord said, well, yeah, you, you can do whatever you want. All, even Paul said, all things are lawful for you, but not everything's profitable. Is having gonorrhea really a profitable thing for you? Or chlamydia? Or syphilis? Um, you know, um, in, in February um, uh, this last year, Marion County Health and Human Services um, warned residents of a spike in syphilis with a 216% increase from 2018 to 2022. Oregon is one of the worst sexually transmitted states in the nation. Congratulations. And, um, and what's that a result of? It's not a result of education inequality. It's a result of human rebellion against God sexually. That's all, that's all it is. Um, so, you know, the, the calamity is not God's way of communication, but rather calamity is a result of man's rebellion. When we do what God tells us not to do, we say, yeah, God, we're gonna do it our way. Don't be shocked when you sense the, the repercussions of those things. Um, these are things to think about. This is why Jesus says, you're gonna die just like everybody else. He says to them, unless, except you repent. See, and that's the, that's the, that's, uh, the next thing I'd like to just kind of think about is, as we think through this. The issue is not to philosophize the situation, but rather to analyze the destination. D Jesus doesn't even get into the situation itself about the death of the Galileans or the men that died in the pool of Siloam. He focuses on their uh, end destination. He says, you guys that are standing here talking about this right now, you're gonna die just like them. He doesn't even talk about them. He talks about the people that are standing in front of him. And he's basically saying, you know, you're all gonna die. Um, and um, it's funny how people kind of like to forget that. Boy, we live in a culture that likes to forget that we're gonna die. That's why some of you are mad at me right now for preaching a sermon on death. You're like, Brad, it's supposed to be Christmas. And man, you're talking about death and I just don't wanna hear about it. La, 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 la. Uh, I don't wanna hear about death. 10 out of every 10 people die. I hate when you say that because that means me. I'm going to die sometime. Yes, you are. 
William Randolph Hearst, if you remember uh, reading about him or learning, maybe you're old enough to remember him, um, but he was uh, an American uh, businessman, newspaper publisher, politician, but very wealthy, very, very wealthy. But as he got older, he ordered his whole staff, which was hundreds of people, that he um, never wanted to hear anyone ever talk about death. And he became really obsessed with this. Like if, if you mentioned anything about death, he would fire you on the spot. Um, and he was really obsessed and he was always constantly trying to make sure that there was no obstacles or no things that might cause death or even think about death or talk about death. That was kind of his obsession toward the end of his life. Guess what happened to Hearst, who tried to do what he could to stop others from mentioning death? He died. 1951, he died, just like everyone else. Um, the fear of death and anti-aging research is gaining in popularity. Have you seen some of these articles? The Business Insider, December 7th, the tech billionaires uh, are trying to hack longevity and live forever. People like Jeff Bezos, Peter Thiel, Zuckerberg, and others, they're all putting huge amounts of money um, investing, trying to reverse aging at the cellular level. Um, interesting engineering article in uh, November 7th, uh, Chinese scientists claim to have achieved the key uh, anti-aging breakthrough. <laughs> this one sort of cracked me up. The team of Chinese scientists have identified a group of cell, cells called uh, CHIT1 in the spinal cord, which is linked to the process of aging. While the scientists are still in early stages of understanding the practical application of this discovery, they believe that taking a daily vote dose of vitamin C might slow down aging. <laughs> Turns out your mom was right when she was cramming. Remember those big vitamin C pills that were like horse pills? Um, uh, Apparently, that, that, she was right. Um, yeah, you know, uh, but, but um, well, vitamin C, anybody want to take a guess? I mean, I'm not a scientist and I'm not a Chinese laboratory person, um, uh, which I'm really glad I don't have that job, especially in Wuhan. But, um, <laughs> but uh, do you really think vitamin C is going to help our aging thing that much? Um, all the essential oil people, yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> just take your daily dose of vitamin C. Um, uh, I don't believe it. Uh, I'm a cynic, a skeptic. Um, I'll tell you why, because the Bible says people are gonna live around 120 years at the best and then they're gonna die. That's what the Bible says. Um, now that's gonna change again in the millennial kingdom. That's an interesting thing. More like the antediluvian world. Remember in the pre-flood years, uh, people lived to be almost a thousand years, Methuselah and the gang. Um, we're gonna go back to that in the millennial kingdom, the Bible says, which is kind of interesting. Uh, that's where aging is gonna be different. Um, but all that to say, you know, this idea, we can sit around and philosophize about our situation, but the, the most important thing you have to do is understand, yeah, we're gonna die. So when you die, do you know where you're gonna go? Are you gonna go north or south? Um, well, Brett, I like to think, well, but let me stop you right there. Do you really want to you know, gamble your eternal future in something that you like to think. Because liking to think something is, is perhaps one of the dumbest things to base anything on. I hear that all the time in this relativistic world. We become so relativistic as not only a world, but even in Christian circles, I'm shocked. We're so open-minded, our brains are falling out. Uh, that's where we are as a culture. But if you believe the Bible at all, or even have some interest in the Bible, here's what the Bible says. Um, there's really only two choices, heaven, eternal life in heaven, or eternal death in hell. Now there's some people say, well, death in hell is no big deal because it's, it's really just annihilation. You, you just, you get thrown in hell and then you're annihilated and you cease to exist. By the way, if that were the thing, I'm not sure I'd even be afraid of that. Uh, I'd be like, well, whatever, I cease to exist. Maybe that'd be a good thing. Like, I, I, that doesn't really cause me concern, honestly. I'm just gonna say that. But that's not what the Bible says. There's this whole doctrine out there that some churches are trying to say, annihilation, and, or, you know, some people even are trying to say there's no such thing as hell. But the Bible talks more about hell than it talks about heaven. So if you're an honest Bible student, Revelation 20 is the part that, to me, clarifies a lot. Um, if you remember, there's actually different compartments that the Bible describes that we clumsily call hell. Hades, Sheol, uh, Abraham's bosom, uh, we could talk about, I've done whole teachings on that. I'm not gonna go into all that today, but, but it, the way it all shakes out is if you die as a Christian today, um, you get to be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I, I believe we get to be with the Lord, like, like the thief on the cross. Jesus said, today, you're gonna be buried in the ground and someday you're gonna wake up and be with me. That's not what he said. He said, today, you're gonna be with me in paradise. Um, from the cross forward, if a Christian dies, 
um, they get to be with the Lord. And, and um, we get to that where I am, there you may be also, Jesus said. So that's a beautiful thing. If you're a non-believer, a secular atheist rejecting Jesus and the Messiah, if you die, um, uh, what happens? Well, it's a long story, but um, when you die, you eventually get uh, to a place called the great white throne judgment, where you will be judged according to your, uh, your life, whether you were good or bad. And we already have established, the Bible says you're bad. Even if you think you're good, all your, your motive meter and your sin meter, it'll be right there in front of the Lord and, and you'll be judged. Everyone at the great white throne judgment is then taken and thrown into Gehenna is the Greek word, which is more the traditional hell that we all think of, a uh, place of burning, but it's also outer darkness. And, and when Satan and his demons are thrown there in Revelation 20, it says that there, there's eternal torment that is, it's not this uh, ceasing to exist. It's a place where people are tormented eternally. Well, Brett, I like to think of God as love and he wouldn't send me to hell. This is why I'm so shocked that people don't really understand the Bible narrative. The Lord says, I love you so much for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you see how ridiculous it is for somebody saying, I don't think God will send me to hell. That's, that's correct. But you have to be really careful about this because if you reject the love of Christ and what he did on the cross, um, God has every right to do whatever he wants to do. And he's sovereign, he can, he can do whatever you want. But he's, he's, he's trying to woo us to, to go to heaven. Why would I wanna to go to heaven? Um, Revelation, I love what Revelation uh, 20 uh, talks about this. It says in Revelation 21, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things will be passed away. Does that sound like a good plan? Count me in on that one. But eternal death and suffering, um, that's, that's something that we, we should wanna be careful of. You know, Luke chapter 13, we're gonna see on Wednesday night, verse 24 says, strive to enter into the straight or the narrow gate. Um, uh, you know, many will seek to enter in, but will not be able to. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow. It's, it's through one little gate that gets you into heaven. And that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father, which is in heaven, but by me. And so when people say, well, if God loves people, he wouldn't allow people to go to hell. Um, here's what the Bible says. Like for example, 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us. That's humanity, to us word not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is the heart of God. He wants, he wants people to be saved. But as it turns out, now I know there's the, the people out there that are saying, Brett, sovereignty, God's sovereignty. And then there's other people, no, human responsibility and the whole big debate. I know that's out there. Um, I, I'm always laughing at these guys that are trying to cram this whole thing into a nice, neat little package. Um, but uh, again, I'm gonna say it again. I believe that God is sovereign and he will send people to hell in that, in that sense of his sovereignty. But at the same time, I also believe it's a choice that you're gonna make. And it's really clear. Uh, Jesus is talking about a choice when he says, unless you repent, you're gonna die just like everybody else. That's what Jesus is saying here, back to our original text here in Luke 13. Unless you repent, you're gonna die just like these Galileans, just like the guys that got crushed by the pool of Siloam Tower. You're all gonna die. But if you want, the only difference is I accept you repent. So what is repent, repentance? Because this is what this verse says. The Lord is not willing that any of us to perish, but, but that, that we would, that all should come to repentance. Let me tell you what repentance is not before I tell you what it is, because people get confused on this. Repentance is not um, being perfect from that day forward. Uh, I repent of my sins and now I'm going to walk with Jesus perfectly and I shall never sin again. If that were the requirement, what repentance means, how many of us would actually make it to heaven? None of us. Uh, Paul the apostle wouldn't have made it to heaven because remember after he was a believer and converted and saved, he said stuff like, man, I do the things I don't wanna do and I don't do the, I, Paul the apostle, am the chiefest of sinners. He said that as an old man. He didn't say I was, he says I am, which is kind of interesting. So the point is he was repentant, but he still struggled with sin. So that's, that's, so repentance doesn't mean you're perfect from that day forward. 
When you repent, what that means is you're changing your mind. Repentance means to do an about face. It's actually like a military term. When you say about face, that's what repentance means. It means to do a 180 degree turn and to change your direction and the way you're thinking. Um, I think it will affect your behavior. A true repentant person, you'll start to see good fruit in your life from repentance. That's, that's gonna be a, a natural byproduct of repentance, not perfection, but you will see improvement. Um, now, here's where it gets a little sticky and tricky. Um, if you repent, is that what saves you? Yeah, uh, that's a tough one because, you know, the Bible says, you know, repent. And Jesus says, repent. I want everybody to be saved. So you got to repent. So you're like, okay, if I repent, then I'm saved. Well, that's, that's a little trickier than that because you choosing to repent, as it turns out, that's kind of a work of the flesh, isn't it? Like you're, you're, you're saying, I'm going to repent. That's what you're doing. Are you saved by anything you've done? Bible says, no, Ephesians 2.8, you're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves, not of works. Um, you know, it's, it's a gift from God. Um, that's, what, that's what the Bible says. But here's the thing. Repentance is when you say, I, I, I'm gonna choose to accept what Jesus did and that's what saved you. What Jesus did on the cross, that's what saved you. It's a little bit like if after church, like what are we gonna do after church? Uh, hey, let's go to Fred Meyer and get some eggnog. Now, none of you are probably planning on doing that after the church service today, maybe. But now that I've planted that seed in your head, I, well, I, I can go for some eggnog today after church. Let's go to old Fred Meyer's after church. Now, whether you get in your car and go to Fred Meyer and get eggnog after church, that's a decision you have to make. Question, does God know which direction you're gonna go after church? Does he know every decision y'all are gonna make when you get into the car, other than waiting 50 minutes to get out of the parking lot? Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, he's, he's going to work patience in you and all that. But whether you go to get eggnog or not, that's, that's, that's a choice you have to make. But God already sovereignly knows what you're going to do. This is the great mystery of who God is. He's way bigger than what we can figure out. But in the same way, you still have to make a choice whether you're going to go get eggnog. And it's still a choice on your, t on your agenda. Same thing's true of salvation. Um, the Lord says, repent unless you choose to repent. Um, you're gonna die just like these guys. And the, the implication is not just death, but eternal death. Um, so the question then becomes, have you considered where you're gonna go? Have you, have you done what you need to do um, in, in, in this idea of repentance? Have you, have you said, I, I'm gonna acknowledge my sin before God? That's that first thing we talked about, that we're all sinners. And have you acknowledged that, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need salvation? So the way you're saved is Romans 10 verse nine tells us, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's confession with the mouth and belief in the heart. Um, even those things aren't what saves you. It's that Jesus died on the cross. It's, it's like the free ticket that Jesus gives. Um, becoming a Christian is just simply accepting that and, and, and believing through faith. Um, that's how we're saved. We're saved by grace through faith. Not of our works, not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. Um, I hope you're all saved. If you are a Christian today, this is good news um, because your death day, you know, we all celebrate our birthday, but your death day is gonna be the best day of your life. If you're a Christian, it only gets better from there. That's why God says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And that's why a solid Christian who really gets all this stuff, a person who really understands that we're headed to heaven and they believe it with all their heart, death does not have a grip on them. Uh, there's a lot of Christians that are like, yeah, you know, the day I die is just, it's gonna be the greatest day. And they're not afraid of death. We live in a culture that fears death, tries to put off death, and, and we try to cover up the evidence of death. And we're trying desperately to not think about death. That's a person I'm, I'm a little concerned about. Do you know where you're gonna go when you die? Or you could be confident and say, I know I'm going to heaven. When I die, it's only gonna get better from there. This life on earth is but a vapor, the Bible says but we get to be an eternal life with, in heaven if you've accepted Christ. Um, that's the thing. Uh, that's what Jesus was getting at. And we'll see that as we uh, finish up chapter 13, Lord willing, on Wednesday night. Would you bow your heads, please, with me? And uh, if you're a Christian, would you just bow your heads and be in prayer right now? And I'm just gonna ask if, if there's anyone here um, and if there's any way you can stay seated, because this is kind of the most important part of the whole service. Um, and I know it's tempting to beat the traffic, but I'm gonna get you out early unless I have to talk about this for a long time of all you guys that are getting up and leaving right now. So, um, but 
I, I really can't leave without inviting you to accept Christ. It's super, it's simple because he did all the work. Jesus died on the cross. You got to do what Romans 10, 9 says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, Jesus Christ. If you do that, the Bible says you're saved. I'd like to help you with that. I'd like to pray with you. If you're, if you're, if for whatever reason you've been hesitant or you've been like, you know, thinking I've gone, I've gone to church all my life. So that must make me a Christian. That doesn't make you a Christian. It's this confession of faith that saves you, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. So if that's you, would you acknowledge that? While everybody else's heads are bad, would you look up at me and give me a quick wave and say, Brett, that's me. I wanna, I wanna pray that prayer. And I'll just lead a prayer here in a minute and, and you, can, you can pray that prayer. Cool, I see you back there. Let me just look around. I don't wanna miss anybody uh, before we, we pack it up today. Anybody else? Cool, I see you there, you, good. Anybody else? Awesome. Back there, way in the back, good. Over here, I see you right there, good. Awesome, nice. I'm just gonna pray this simple prayer of confession and you can just pray this, you and the Lord right now. I'm gonna ask the whole church to pray this out loud. We, out loud. we love praying with y'all as you make this confession of faith. Let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, I believe in your son, Jesus Christ. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins, that he rose up from the grave and that I'm forgiven. Help me to walk with you. Thank you for saving me. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Oh Lord, we thank you for these people who've just accepted in faith the salvation from Jesus. Lord, I pray that they would have that burden of sin just lifted from their shoulders, that they'd know that they're forgiven, past, present, even their future failures, that you've forgiven them. And that we as Christians have the hope of heaven, eternal life. I pray that we'd walk in hope and confidence, not in ourselves, but in you, Lord, for what you've done. Bless your church. And in this Christmas season, Lord, uh, we have a message of life and not death. I pray that we'd let our light so shine before all men and that the good news of, of the eternal life through Jesus would be proclaimed this season, Lord. So bless us as we go our way in Jesus' name. Amen.